This question that you have about GMOs has been put on both hemispheres. In all the countries where I went as an expert, uh, recently in Nagoya, in Japan, in the whole conference on biodiversity, where China introduced GMOs as inviters, 150 countries have preferred to have labeling on GMOs at the borders. And I am proud to be a member of the European Union because we all noticed, all the countries in the world, that European Union was the most developed socially and environmentally place in the world. So um, we have taken with us 150 countries in order to be able to label GMOs at least at the borders. I am a children of molecular biology. I was raised as a young professor of molecular biology at the age of 30. And then the, the French government, after four years in North America, and then the French government asked me to be in the GMO committee, the previous GMO committee before the High Council of Biotechnology, it was called the Committee uh, in Molecular Genetics. And during nine years I was there. Then I was asked by the European Union to be one of the fourth experts at the WTO level in the conflict between the states and European Union on GMO labeling. My own research lab is devoted on the effects of GMOs and pesticides on human health with human embryonic cells without destroying embryos but with cell lines or fresh cells from umbilical cord or from placenta. And also in 208, I was nominated in a commission in order to reassess GMOs in Europe and the method of assessment of GMOs requested by the president of uh, the Council of Ministers of Environment uh, in 2008. So I was recently requested also by India for the new authorization of the GM Brinjal aubergine, uh, like they say also. Uh, and uh, it is this experience that I would like to share with you, not to give you only my own opinion, but also to explain what is the level of the international debates about environmental and health risks and benefits of today's agricultural GMOs. We all admit that it is the first time on Earth for all living species that one species, ours, the human species, is able to modify the hereditary patrimony of all living species around including the species that are eaten, in order to cross and to cross the species barrier, in order to transform at an industrial speed the hereditary patrimony of the species, in order to have to put the hands on evolution. It is the first time in the life, and it is the first time in the history of humankind that this is possible. So we all understand that it's a very potent technology. This potent technology is able to transform the world and to study all genes. You cannot imagine one gene which is not studied by a GMO in a lab. So I recognize the potency of this technology to study life and even to make drugs in confined areas in pharmacies like insulin or like growth hormone. 
When we are in confined areas, this is a very potent technology. When we are in fields, it is very important not to take human and agricultural environment as a bench for scientists. And it is very important to know what we are doing because it is also the first time, as you may know, that we have a real loss in biodiversity on Earth. 20% of all species are disappearing. Mammals, insects, birds, fishes, etc. 20%, so it's a very sixth extinction of species according to 1,360 specialists in all the uh, WTO and in all the um, countries around the world, in 90, 195 countries of NATO, it's admitted that we are in a big, extreme, big, extremely big loss of biodiversity. So the matter is important, and it is important to know what really are the GMOs designed for agriculture, because they are mostly uh, the only GMOs in the environment designed to be outside, designed to be in food and feed, designed to be in the ecosystem. And my major concern, even before what is that doing on butterflies or bees, which is a matter, is what is that doing on human health? And what is the truth? How the question, the scientific question is, how has it been tested? If you are able to answer this question, then you are able to enter the debate. So I am a member of uh, CreGen. CreGen is an independent committee of scientists who was, uh, request, which was requested by um, a lot of uh, ministers or organisms in the world. It is in favor of well-controlled genetic engineering, but mostly thinks that genetic engineering is not well-controlled today. Uh, it's for the research on efficiency of GMOs, strategy and goals and for independent analysis of the evaluation and traceability. And we think that we need, I will explain you why, more tests on environment and health, especially on health, before deliberate release. Um, most, we need transparency and expertise on the assessment of GMOs. We were expert for different organisms, like I said, uh, including the Indian Supreme Court, um, the European Union, the Ministry of Quebec for the GM Salmon, which is actually a big debate over there, the Ministry of Italy on transgenic wines, the Ministry of Tunisia, Egypt, and different food retailers in Europe the University of Montreal, the European Special Agency, who wondered if the future people who will, be, who will go to March will have to eat GMOs or not. And after three years, they decided not. This will be in 220 or 30. So first of all, we will concentrate on what are agricultural GMOs because this is a point of debate. A lot of GMOs producers prefer to make think that the debate is on genetic engineering per se. This is not really true because a lot of people admit that genetic engineering is a very important tool even to make drugs in confined areas, but do discuss the conditions 
to make that in open fields and in the environment. So, in fact, I do not know very many people who are against genetic engineering per se, but they discuss the conditions to, be, to go in the environment. And this is a point which is debated around the world, not genetic engineering and to say no, no research in genetic engineering, no GMOs in labs. This has never been requested by any authority. And the debate is what are the conditions to make trades and to patent the life and to go with GMOs in the fields and what are the health and environmental controls to do that? And this is a debate. So we will concentrate on agricultural GMOs for that reason. Agricultural GMOs are composed, and this is not well known because there is one billion dollars per year for advertisements in this area. So most people don't know what are agricultural GMOs at all. 63% of those are just genetically modified to be able to absorb the major herbicide in the world without dying. I repeat, 63% of agricultural GMOs are genetically modified in order to be able to absorb without dying the major herbicide in the world, which is Roundup. It is already in France, in the States, in different European countries, the major herbicide polluting rivers, not biodegradable, because the company has lost several court affairs saying that it was not biodegradable like they were saying. And um, they have modified plants in order to be able to cultivate the plants together with their herbicide. And do you imagine that most people think that GMOs will be able to reduce or to eliminate pesticides and that GMOs have been designed to absorb the major pesticide of the world? because an herbicide is a pesticide, an insecticide is a pesticide, a fungicide is a pesticide. So the generic world is pesticide. 21% of the GMOs are designed, or let's begin by the third uh, group, 60% of the GMOs are designed to produce their own insecticides, like Bt maize. So people think there will be less insecticide on the field, but they do forget, because of the advertisement of the company, that the plant is able to produce itself very big quantities of insecticide. Of course, they are proteic toxins, but it's not because it's a protein that it's not toxic for humans. You know the, the prion, the pathogenic prion that gives the mad cow disease is a protein. A lot of toxins from snakes uh, are proteins. So it's not because it's a protein that it's 